Good morning. Yes, it is very empty in here, but I'm glad you're here, and we're glad you're watching at home, and, or wherever you are. As I said last week, you never know where people are watching, and so uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for all the words of encouragement that folks have sent me uh, through the email and through other channels. I am Skip Tilton. I'm a member here at Harvest Baptist Church, and the ministry that the Lord's given me is called From Day One Ministries, where we help people understand biblical worldview and your walk as a Christian in this present day and the influences that, that can cause us uh, not to maybe think properly about the Word of God and how we should apply it in our lives. So we've been examining our worldview, and we are starting here with 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And I, I know I could spend probably a month just preaching on this one verse alone. Uh, back when I was pastoring, it wouldn't be any problem. There's so much in here. But I'm glad that when we understand a biblical worldview, it's not hard to talk to other people in meekness and fear because when we understand what history has taught us, we also understand what's going to happen in the future. And people need to get their relationship right with the Lord. And the Bible talks about our present generation in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4, where it reminds us, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine unto them. And so there's a constant <clears throat> interaction between man and the world that he lives in. And he looks at his world, and he interprets the world that he lives in, and he formulates values in his heart, and these values are the things he actually lives on. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wanna, we're going to talk today about the post-flood world, the world after the flood. And as we get ready to get into this, I just want to show you a couple of things. For instance, this is a picture inside Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. And you see, you see the three floors represented there, and you go into this place, and you start walking around, and you start getting educated, if you're reading everything, if you're not like the young kids and just run around and climb on everything. But when you start going through places like this, they're educating you. But the real challenge is, it's understanding the history that you're being presented in its proper context. Because if you don't have the proper context, then actually you're going to be learning something that may not be true. And in this case, much of what you learn there is not represented in a proper historical context. And so things change in our world. There's constant change in everything that's going on. For instance, here's Mount St. Helens on the left-hand side. This is what the mountain looked like before the eruption. And then after the eruption, it looks like this. And so when you and I are traveling on this journey in this world, we come across things. And if we don't have a knowledge background that helps us understand how things can change and how that impacts how we look and see the world that we live in, you really can be led astray from the true history of the world. Here's another one. This is on Washington's Olympic Peninsula. On the left-hand picture, you're looking at what the loggers had done in a certain area, and they cut down all the trees. So maybe a person goes into that area after all the trees are, are gone, and that's the memory that they have. Okay. Well, on the right-hand side is what that area looks like today. And you see, it's, it's a whole different perspective. I was sharing with my wife and I tried to get a picture of this, and I don't have it yet. But where I grew up, my, my sister and I used to get on the bus, and when we would get picked up, we would drive around this certain curved section of road, and then it would climb up and go over the highway. And you could look out the bus window, and you could see the highway, and you could see the cars going by. I went back to my hometown a couple years ago, and I drove down that same road. And now it's all full of 30 and 40 foot tall trees. And that whole experience I had as a kid is just a memory. Why? Because everything has changed. Change. Change. Change is perhaps one of the most difficult things to absorb and to comprehend in our lives. Because our lives are constantly in change. 
And change is a big component to understanding your worldview, especially when we look at the post-flood world. Because what we're really asking ourselves when we're on this journey uh, is this. How did all this stuff get here that I see today? I mean, how, where did it come from? You know, why is it here? And that's what we're going to look at in examining our worldview. Romans tells us, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's you and me, even his eternal power and Godhead. So people are without excuse. Why? Because you see these changes and they keep, keep uh, honoring God in the way that he's put these things together. You know, does the earth exist because of random chance like secular humanism teaches? I submit to you the earth does not exist due to random chance. The earth exists because of the right conditions. It takes the right conditions to understand what's happening with anything. So in our biblical worldview, when we take the Word of God and we start learning about the Word of God, we start understanding the history of the world. By the way, I didn't put this slide in this message, but I'll say it here. History really is his story. That's what history is. It's the story of what God has done and what God is doing and what God will be doing in the future, past, present, and future. And in that biblical worldview, we can see a series of events that have happened. And like I shared with you, the seven seas of history, which comes from Dr. Gary Parker, we used it in Answers in Genesis. It's the storyline of the Creation Museum while I was there, and it's still there. Uh, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, the cross, a future consummation. Seven major events in the history of the world that if we can begin looking in our world through this type of acrostic, we can make sense out of the world that we live in. So this morning, we're going to deal with the post-flood world. And we're going to start with geology or the geological distribution that I find in the world that I live in. And so in the seven seas, it starts out creation. Then God said in Genesis 1-9, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So in the beginning, we don't know what it looked like. Uh, this is just a a graphic from Ron Blakely out in Colorado. Um, we don't know what that original creation looked like, but there was land and there was water. Okay, so that original geological distribution. God made it and he set it in motion. And then what? He created everything. On those six literal days, all the biology and everything is created and outer space is created and the, and the whole known universe is created. Then what happens? Well, sin comes into the world. Adam sins and Eve sins, and now God's judgment upon the whole creation. So now there's a change from the original way that God had made it because of this sin problem. And so Romans tells us, you know, uh, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. So the whole creation is affected by sin. Then we come to the catastrophe, Noah's flood. We looked at that last week. And so God had Noah build a big ark. This is the answers in Genesis ark up in Kentucky. We don't know what it looked like, but this is their representation of it. And the Bible tells us in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, <coughs> on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, then the windows of heaven were opened, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Then the waters prevailed 15 cubits. That's over 30 feet or so. And the mountains were covered. And so then we have a flood. And we looked at the flood last week. But I want to remind you, every single thing on the planet is now impacted because of this event. The whole planet is impacted because of this real event that happened in the history of the world. What's underneath all that water? Well, in that water is all the debris and everything that's being stirred up from this event on the earth. And so all the trees, all the animals, everything outside of the ark is being destroyed and distributed all around the world under that water. And it's mixing. And, and the, 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 uh, the plate tectonic action and the volcanicity is happening and this turbulence is happening and it's re-terraforming the whole earth. And now there's also the moon. That hasn't changed, but the moon is still out there and the moon is impacting the earth and currents were easily, could be over 88 miles an hour sweeping across and something's happening in that water. 
And so under the water, all these things are happening, and Noah and his family and two of most kinds and seven of other kinds are in the ark. And so then what happens? This, this material keeps moving, and we know from studying the crust of the earth how some of these things work together and how the plates crash into each other, and some things will come up. Others will be formed by other, uh, other uh, elements of the earth in the way it, uh, it, it, res- it, uh, it absorbs pressure and the way that the, the, the plates hit each other and they pull apart and so forth. And so we have mountains and we have all sorts of features that are going to be happening as this land and material rises out of the water, as God's Word tells us. And then, then we get to what you and me experience today. That is the emerging post-flood world. So we go out in our world, and what do we see? We see all sorts of things, like rock layers, right? And we look at those rock layers, and what do we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. What would we expect to find if there was a worldwide flood? We would expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water, all over the earth, and that's what we see. But the secular humanist, he looks at the earth and he says, I don't see any any evidence for a worldwide flood. All I see are billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water, all over the earth. What's the difference? The difference is his worldview. It's the presupposition that he has in his mind that he's looking at the evidence with. And so that's the difference. And so in our world today, we realize scientists are exploring the surface of our earth. We understand about plate tectonics and how these regions, as they, as they move back and forth, create hot spots, volcanicity, uh, earthquakes, all sorts of things on our planet. We even look at our current world today uh, above the water, and we can see regions on both continents that are identical. So we know those continents used to be together in certain areas, and they've been ripped apart uh, by uh, catastrophic mechanisms. And then we also know, looking in our Earth, and this is a little commercial for next week, we're going to look at the Ice Age, because the Ice Age is a real event that happened in the history of the world, and it affects you and me today. And we know from this Ice Age, it has impacted what you and I see today. What does it take to have an Ice Age? Well, it just takes the right conditions. And we're going to talk about that next week. And so an Ice Age literally is just a, is a great increase of snow and ice. But this really happened, and it really impacts our understanding of how our world has become what it is today. And so we'll look at that in detail, but the point I want to bring out to you is this. At the height of the Ice Age, the ocean levels were about 350 feet or more lower than they are at the present day levels. And that impacts our understanding of our post-flood world. And I'll show you why in a moment. And so the result is, is that land currently underwater today would be exposed, and that creates land bridges to many areas of the world. At the height of the Ice Age, it's estimated that at least 30% of all water on the Earth was on top of land in storage. And so the ocean levels were much lower, and as you see in that graphic on the screen, there in the shaded areas, all those areas become dry for quite a long period of time, and there's plenty of time for things to happen, as you'll see in a moment. This is uh, in the area in between Australia and uh, Asia. All this area becomes exposed. And so this is the area between uh, Russia and Canada. It's called Beringa. All of this area becomes dry land. And we have massive amounts of evidence taken from the ocean today, taken from dry land and some of the islands in, in this area, showing the results of what's happened in the historicity of the geology of our planet. We also have uh, uh, the world is going to be impacted because of the Ice Age, because of the serious amounts of water that once existed that we don't see presently today. For instance, here's the western United States, and you can see how many big lakes there used to be in our country. Today, the majority of those lakes are gone, and that's happened through natural causes. But again, the history of the world helps me understand my position in it today. So does it take millions of years, for instance, for coal to form? That's something in the geology. 
But the answer is, it doesn't take millions of years for coal to form. It just takes what? It takes the right conditions. And let me tell you, there's a lot of coal out there. And what is coal? Coal is plant material that has been compressed, and under the right conditions, it's coalified. It's become coal. In the technical journal here, uh, produced by uh, Creation Ministries International, there's a, a tremendous amount of work that's been done to understand what was that pre-flood world like. And one of the things that they recognize is, is that not just that there was a land mass in the pre-flood world, there were also, as it were, floating masses of land. We have some areas like this today in our world, but there's strong evidence that there were floating forests. And uh, that's definitely found in some of the coal seams in the United States. And you could go to, the, to that uh, articles in that magazine uh, to read about those. And we got a lot of coal in the United States. Here you can see the various types of coal. Some coal doesn't burn as hot as other coal. And you can see those black areas there in Pennsylvania. That's called anthracic coal. My wife and I used to burn that when we lived in, in uh, New York. When I was pastoring, we had a coal stove. And I remember one week, it was minus 27. That was the warmest it was outside our house. And yet we had a coal stove. It burned what's called pea coal. Coal that's the size of a little pea. And it was that anthracic coal, and man, we were warm. And by the way, we only had single pane glass, lath and plaster, and hardly any insulation. And yet we could stay warm. 74 degrees in the room where the stove was, and about 65 in the farthest room away from the stove. And so we have this coal. Look at the size of some of these coal beds. This is Powder River, Wyoming. Isn't that amazing? Look at the size of this coal. And you see, there it is, and we know it's there. Now we ask the question, well, it takes the right conditions for that to happen. So how could it get there? And so the Bible gives us a mechanism that can help us understand how they were created. Uh, Look at, the, look at the vehicle in the lower right-hand corner of this picture. This is a massive, massive coal deposit in Australia. And so we have all this coal, and yet the Bible tells us of something that's happened in the past that could take all of this organic material and then lay it down into these massive layers and produce what we see today. And so, well, how long does it take for something to change? Remember, it doesn't take millions of years for something to change. It just takes what? The right conditions. That's right. That's what it takes. Let me just give you a few short examples in the world of minerals and geology. This is called the TP Fountain. It started in 1903. It was created by piping the hot mineral water through a vertical pipe. So they put a pipe in the ground and into a pyramid. As the water exits the top, flows over the structure, and then the travertine deposits and, uh, and the other structures are created. Look at this thing. Massive, okay? It originally was just a pipe and a basic structure. Now it's been filled in. Here's another one, okay? This one's found across, they're called teepee fountains. So it doesn't take millions of years for something to change. It just takes what? The right conditions. How about stalactites and stalactites? When I was a kid, I was told in science, in high school, Drip, 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 long periods of time. Ah, no! <coughs> it doesn't take long periods of time. This takes the right conditions, less than 150 years. This shawl, that's one that's on the side of a wall of a cave, was produced. Here's a great picture at the Mount Issa mines. Uh, you can see the stalactites and stalagmites. And there in the back of the center of the picture, you can see the men right there. And actually in the center of the picture, there's actually a sign, an electrical sign, to tell you how to go through this mine. And so it doesn't take millions of years. It just takes the right conditions. Jerry Trout, cave specialist with the Forest Service, says that through photo monitoring, he's watched the stalactite grow several inches in a matter of days. From 1924 to 1988, there was a visitor sign above the entrance to Carlsbad Caverns that said Carlsbad was at least 260 million years old. In 1988, the sign was changed to read 7 to 10 million years. Then for a little while, the sign read it was 2 million years old. Now the sign is gone. Amen? Why? 
because they realize it doesn't take millions of years. It just takes the right conditions. And this is what I mean about applying my biblical worldview to the world that I live in today. And so we've looked at that geology. Now let's come over into the world of biology. And so we'll start first with plants, especially plant distribution. We live on this earth. Everywhere we go, we see, see all these sorts of plants. <clears throat> so this is from the tsunami in Japan, what you're seeing on your screen. And I think it's a great example of debris. A lot of times we think of the flood, we think of water, but we don't think of the massive and massive and massive amounts of debris that would be floating all over the ocean, okay? And in the ocean at different depths. And so here you can see a before and after picture, before the tsunami and then after all of this debris floating everywhere. We see another example of this when it comes to volcanicity or volcanoes from Mount St. Helens. This lake, Spirit Lake, was absolutely pristine before it erupted. And then when that blast came out of the volcano, it stripped the side of the mountain away and threw all those trees and everything into the lake. And so there's lots of debris that's going to be created from a flood. And another component is to recognize that not only does this debris float, but this debris lodges itself against the shore when it reaches it. So think of it this way. Here you see a very basic picture of the ocean, and you can see the, the grass growing there, and so the high tide would come up that high, and so you have, you have material. What if you have a lot of material in that water, and it's going up and it's piling up on the beach? And then what happens when the tide goes down. Or let's say you have an ice age and now the ocean levels are constantly going down and now you have all this debris that's piling up and piling up and piling up. You're actually gonna have biology begin to grow. It's going to grow in those areas where the debris fields have been on the sides of these different areas. And so it, it, it shows us the power of water as a mechanism to carry material. Now, I was going to bring mine in, but I didn't. But I want to show you, especially you kids, this is a cute little story about these ducks. They're called friendly floaties, okay? And so on January 10th of 1992, there was a shipping crate was going uh, from Hong Kong to Tacoma, Washington. And in it, it had these ducks. They also had uh, blue turtles and red beavers and green frogs. And the container fell off the ship out in the middle of the Pacific. And when it fell off, it broke open. And now all of these, these bath toys made for kids are now floating all over the ocean. And what happened was one of the scientists realized, hey, we're over here spending a lot of money trying to put things in the water to float to see how the ocean currents work. They had actually put a thousand different things in the ocean. Well, here they had a real world science experiment. And so they followed it. Look at this graph. This shows you just how far these toys floated around the world. They've been tracking them. 1992, it starts. 95, you can see them up there in Alaska. All the way over to England and France by 2007. Because, you know, hey, these toys, like they're made for kids in a bathtub, like they're kind of indestructible, <laughs> you know? So they have been floating around in the ocean for years and they've been able to track them. And this helps give us an understanding of the post-flood world with all of this debris and how all of this debris is going all over the place, and then it's going to land on shorelines. The ice age begins, by the way, at the end of the flood. The ocean levels start going down. The debris gets planted on the shorelines, and now we have biology, biological planting zones, as it were, being created around the world, and we can track the spread of these things through the currents in the ocean. So here we're just looking at the hook and arm plant, and we can see how it's, it is it magnifies the majority of it being grown along those two coasts from the ocean currents. Here's another one for the Sago Palm. You know, there it is off of Madagascar and then over on the north side of Australia. But when we understand ocean currents, we can see the relationship. 
There's 156 relationships between South America and Africa, and 174 between South America and Southern Asia. And so biogeography, we can see how plants have been distributed. And it's so fascinating in this field to look at it because you can, you're looking at a graphic here that shows you the maximum vegetation at, at the end of the ice age and how things have spread. And ocean currents have a lot to do with it. In biology, they call some of these plants endemic, which means it's restricted to a peculiar, uh, uh, it's restricted or peculiar to a locality or a region. And so we have high numbers of plants in these certain regions, especially in the tropical Andes and in Madagascar. Massive amounts of biology growing together there, lots of different kinds. And understanding ocean currents gives us an insight into how much of this indeed came into fruition. And so again, the post-flood world, I look at this biology, what does it tell me? It doesn't tell me molecules to man evolution at all. It shows me a mechanism where I can understand how seed distribution was ha happened around the world that we live in. Another thing on biogeography is animal distribution. So the Bible tells us clearly that what did God do? He put two of every kind and seven kinds of others with Noah into this barge, right? And so the barge floated on top of the flood and then it landed. There's a wonderful challenging article at creation.com written by Dr. Russell Humphreys talking about where did the ark land? Many people wanna say, well, the ark landed on the top of Mount Ararat. And that's not true because Mount Ararat is a modern volcano, okay? It landed in the region of Ararat. And Dr. Humphreys is gonna argue that it probably landed much farther south than where traditional places put the ark. And so when we see what has happened during the flood, we begin to realize this ark lands, then there's an ice age, and then there's plenty of time and plenty of opportunity for all of these animals to get out of the ark. And as we're gonna see in a moment, the earth is prepared to be able to feed them, and they are gonna begin spreading out all over the world. There's migration opportunities and plenty of time for them to walk all over the earth. And so when we look at the migration of animals and we recognize the diversity upon the planet, I have a mechanism that can explain why do we only see kangaroos in Australia? How come most possums are in North America and South America? Why are there only raccoons in North America? Because the distribution of these animals, these are the ones that have survived the long journeys from whence they first began. Isn't that fascinating? I can make sense out of the world that I live in. Molecules to man evolution is trying to teach you that all of these things evolved where they're found, and yet they have no mechanism that can show how evolution is possible, molecules to man, let alone explain the massive diversity of the species across the planet. Well, in the biogeography, not only do we have animals, we also have what? Humans, you and me. And so what about mankind? Well, mankind was on the ark, right? And mankind got off the ark, but mankind disobeyed at first. The animals are on their way, amen? But man, he's hanging around and he's building. He's building a tower to reach up into God. The Bible tells us about confusion, the Tower of Babel. So God comes down and he takes languages and he brings them into, consist into existence. And what happens? So the Lord scattered them abroad from, all, from there over the face of all the earth and they cease from building the city. And so now we have a group of people, boom, they start spreading out across the globe along with the animals. And as you're gonna learn in our message on dinosaurs, they start writing about what they're seeing and we have historical records of animals <coughs> that they're running into all over the world. So we have this wonderful world that's created and here we see the, the town of Ur. 
And Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And I want to draw your attention. This is the post-flood world, okay? And I want us to take a moment and consider what is the world like in this region at this time? Because the Bible gives us crystal clear understanding about what this is like. So Job is from Ur, okay? He doesn't live in Ur when this is being recorded. I'll show you where he lives in a moment. But Job 1, 1 and 2 tell us a little bit about Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born unto him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. If Job lived in Rock Hill, South Carolina, do you think we might know who this guy is? Could you imagine how much land it would take to have a family and a farm and a ranch like this? <coughs> it would be massive. And it would take massive amount of food, a massive amount of water, and a lot of times, you and I, we hear about Israel, we hear about the Middle East, and all we think about today is desert, and that it's dry. Ladies and gentlemen, it hasn't been that way all the time, especially after the flood. Because after the flood, it's, it's estimated that the ocean temperatures were as high as 81 to 82 degrees. The evaporation rates in water that warm would be seven times more than they are today. There would be so much water coming out of the sky that the earth would become a terrarium after the flood. All this water's going everywhere, and the Bible's telling us that when Job, when, when at this time in his life, <coughs> he's living, and we also know about two of his friends. One comes from Chaldea, the other one comes from Saba, and it's believed that actually where Job lived is where you see it on the map here in Midian. And so in order for that, if he lived there today, they'd all die because it's total desert. But back then it was lush and green. And we know this from the text. Why? Because we've got another historical event that happens. We've got a guy named Abraham, right? And look at this map taken out of a Bible history online. This is what I mean about not recognizing things within their historical context in the world. Everything on this map makes you think Abraham traveled through the desert. He didn't. It wasn't a desert back then. It was actually green. It was actually called the Fertile Crescent because it was full of life and biology, and man could survive very easily because there was so much plant growth. But Genesis 13 gives us a great insight to this because here's Abraham with Lot. And it says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, which is what? Eden. And, and <coughs> like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. So it's telling us even Egypt is lush and watered and full and vibrant and people are there. We'll talk about Egypt in a second. As you go to Zoar, and Zoar is at the southern end of the Dead Sea. And so they're standing at the north end of the Dead Sea, a little farther north. Everywhere that Lot is looking, it's green and lush and wonderful. And so he chooses that land. And so that's in this area right here. So we know it was green. And actually, I like this map. It shows you the table of the nations, but it shows you how green things are because that's the way the world was at the end of the flood. It's changed since then. But when we read in our text, we need to consider the historical context in which some of these things are happening. And so then, back to the human migration. And so man, after the Tower of Babel, uh, this map, by the way, shows you where some of the different families and, and so forth went around the world. And then man starts spreading out, and he starts going across the face of the earth. <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to one archaeological and historical discovery that actually happened in the United States 
And these are called Clovis points. They're the tips of spears and arrows from bows. And they were found in Folsom and Clovis, New Mexico in particular. But these points have been found all the way up into what that area is called Beringa, all the way back into Russia. These same uh, archaeological finds. So we know man was north and he came south. We know that. We have historical fact in it. And sometimes when you and I think about, you know, how did man spread out across the face of the earth, we're not putting it into the right picture. So I want to just share with you very briefly, how did people get around back then? Well, they walked, sure. But did you know they also had ships? Did you know that one of the largest fleets of ships in the world was actually during the Ming Dynasty by this man, Admiral Zheng He? In 1402 to 1424, this guy had a fleet that was unbelievable, okay? And so this is an actual modern picture of one of his smaller ships that was rebuilt on the site of where they had this great shipyard. They call it the Treasure Shipyard in China. So it's a full-scale replica of one of his smaller ships. And you can go on there and check it out. And so this is from a museum in Singapore talking about Zheng He and his treasure ship. Look at the size of his ship compared to the Santa Maria, the Nina, and the Pinta. This is massive, okay? I mean, it's massive. This isn't just one either. And so he had these ships, this treasure fleet. This is from a... Uh, <coughs> This is from the museum in Singapore, and he had 100 plus to 208 ships with as many as 28,000 people on board. And they took seven major journeys out of China around the world. They went all the way down to the eastern coast of Africa and other places. And so ships, this is a model of a Zheng He Chinese junk support ship. And I show you this because of what I'm going to show you in the next slide. You see, when I grew up in New England, you know what I was taught? America was founded by the English. Man, we came over from Europe, and that's how we all got here. Well, that's not true. How do we know? Because in Badoga Bay in California, in a river down there, they've got one of one of Zheng He's Chinese junk ships buried in that Sacramento River. Not only that, they've got these Ming Dynasty coins and everything they find all over the region down there. So what do we know? We know the Chinese made it to North America a lot, a lot of time before anybody else did from Europe. And then, of course, when we get into biodiversity, we're going to talk about DNA. And what you're going to learn is that the Indian population in our country today, when we look at their DNA, it comes from a Mongolian background. So the first settlers in the North America actually came through Alaska, through Russia, through Alaska, and came down that way, or they could have floated. They could have been deposited during some of these journeys by these explorers. Then remember, at the height of the Ice Age, ocean levels were what? 350 feet lower than present day levels. Okay. So when I look at my world today, do I have any evidence of man living in places that are now underwater? Of course you do. And there's quite a few of them. Notice this big lion sculpture in the Bay of Cambi in India. Here, here's another area of that same area. Look at all these structures that are now underwater, okay? <clears throat> Discovered by marine scientists in 2002, 120 feet underwater in the Gulf of Cambay along the, the western region. Cities underwater, Heracleon near Alexandria, underwater, and yet we have these sculptures and everything else. They're fully standing. They're upright. I know there's been a massive earthquake in this area, but more than that, we still have these, these, uh, these structures underwater outside of Japan and off of Taiwan. Over and over again, we find evidence. What? Evidence in our earth of a cataclysmic process that happened, a flood, and then since that flood, we have other evidences of other change that has happened over time. And without a worldwide flood, you can't explain these things. With the worldwide flood, I can't explain them in their context. 
How about the Sahara Desert, right? It's always been desert. Not at all. The Sahara Desert, here's a petroglyph in the Sahara. You can see it there. It kind of looks like a giraffe. The Sahara Forest. The Sahara was actually a lust place as recently as 6,000 or so years ago. Early humans left behind cave art <coughs> showing crocodiles and large dinosaur fossils, suggesting an environment lush enough to support 20-foot-long animals. Today, scientists have gone over the region with satellites and they permeated the sand and they see ancient river channels and housing and other settlements all over the area in the Sahara. The Sahara is a veritable art gallery of the prehistoric paintings. The evidence is enough to show that the Sahara was one of the well-populated areas of the prehistoric world, yet there is his, man's work, in the most inaccessible corners of the desert. Thousands of figures of tropical and aquatic animals, enormous herds of cattle, hunters armed with bows and boomerang, even domestic scenes of what? Women and children, circular huts in which they live. Then what do you do? Then you go to the petroglyphs. I'm just going to show you two slides of them. There's thousands of them. What do we see? We see man and cattle and all those kind of things. And so in our mind today, we see the Sahara in Egypt. Oh, it's a desert. It hasn't always been that way. And in the day of Abraham and Lot, the Bible says that what? He looked and he saw the plain of Jordan. It was well watered as like Egypt. So the world that once was has changed as we look at it today. But when we're in our scriptures, we should consider what's the historicity of what's happening in the context of what I'm reading about when we go back to those areas that deal with the growth of nations and their place in the world. And then, of course, there's human DNA. We can pattern this. We can look at it. And so our world today basically shows a lot of change in a very short period of time, especially these areas, these desert areas that did not exist at the time of the flood. And so we look at our world today and we have secular humanism and we have the word of God. And so on this last point, I want to just challenge you with the idea of humans and population. And so the Bible talks about a creation and then a fall and then a flood. And then since that flood, we have the Ice Age. And at the time of Christ, there were about 300 million people estimated to be living on the earth. Okay? And so the earth population, we have all these empires that are listed. After the flood, the Tower of Babel, we learn about Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, or the Romans. We have all of these people. The current world population estimate is about 7.7, 7.8 billion people. According to the estimates by the demographic researchers at the Population Reference Bureau, as of 2015, there have been, you ready? 108.2 billion who've ever been born on the planet. I got a question for you. If evolution is true, where's all the evidence for all these people and where's all their artifacts? We should see all sorts of stuff all over the planet over long periods of time, if that's the real history of the world. Yet when I understand the Word of God and what the Word of God lays out for me about the history of the world, I can make sense out of the world that I live in today. Why? Because what we see in God's world agrees with what we read where? In God's Word. And you see, really, folks, it comes down to this. It's all about the authority of the Word of God. And God's given us his word, and he's given us a way that we can understand him, and we can understand the world that we live in. And if we'll look at the post-flood world through the lens of scripture, we can make sense. We can make sense of a lot of things. Not everything, but the majority of things. Amen? Thank you for spending our time with us this morning. I hope you'll come back next week and as we learn about the Ice Age. Lord, thank you for our time we've had together. Bless the service ahead. Thank you for our dear folks. Thank you for looking over them. Minister to the needs that are represented within our congregation and our people. Help those outside of our congregation to come and know you and walk with you as well. Bless our governments as they make decisions. In Jesus' name, amen.